Hi, it's Susan from World Peaceful, and I've decided to do another few more recordings in respect of Rupert Murdoch. Rupert said that he felt that Australians did not appreciate the sacrifice of the soldiers here in Australia, and I made comments about that was true because we hadn't had the lived experience. You know, I'm of a generation. I didn't have a grandfather in the war. My father um, didn't go to the Korean War because he had a problem, a physical problem, which prevented him from going. So in my family, there's no lineage of, of soldiers. Although, um, I'm just wondering. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd have to check with my father, but I don't think so. There's certainly been no stories passed down. So anyway, what I explained is a little bit about the way I live, which is going with the flow. I allow life to unfold. I'm not here planning it or controlling it. I let things happen. Now, I just recorded that story of Rupert's this morning where he made the comment about people not appreciating the sacrifices. Now, I took the dog for a walk. I've just come back. And this is how it works. I go for a walk and I suddenly feel to go towards this. It's actually a box on, it's like, looks like a little tree box. You know, it's sort of on a pole. And these are very common near childcare centres where people have little libraries in boxes and there's books in them and you can take them. Now, I just decided to suddenly, ah, oh, and I was really mindful of when I first saw it, oh, that's interesting, that's come into my reality was what I thought. I go up to it and then I have a look through the books. None of them interested me. Now, one of them was on this subject, which was precisely what Rupert was talking about, and the words came into my mind. People don't appreciate the sacrifice that they made. Now, I wouldn't, definitely would never have taken this book because I'm not interested in, in war uh, issues. Although I've met soldiers and I, was, I had a partner who was an ex-soldier. But I'm not naturally drawn to that. I'm drawn to the peace area. So I thought I will read it for him because he made that point. So this is actually for him. It's chapter 19 and the, the title is The Fair Dinkums. For those who don't know, Australians, in our vernacular, was the word fair income. <laughs> in fact, the guy I talked to yesterday he goes, fair income. <laughs> and I laughed. <laughs> I thought, yep, took him with an Aussie ear. It's very unique to Australians. No one else says it. But it's like, fair income, is that true? <laughs> That's what we say. <laughs> so I'm going to read you this section because it's it's really informative. And I think... It'll also be illuminating for Rupert Murdoch as well because this, this is pretty much recorded live. So there's a little bit of a saying at the front, at the top, saying, louder the sound from out the gully comes the marching feet, the sullen roll of drums. That's by C.J. Dennis. So it starts, they were marching all right. By June 1915, when 10,000 Australian casualties had been announced, the cost of nationhood had begun to be felt. It would worsen, the casualty lists would sicken and fidgety, nervous groups would hang around the notice boards in the cities to see the casualty lists pinned up as they were received and murmur in anger as they searched for names they knew. But that first gallant deed was never regretted. For the whole of the war, there was the enlistment of the waves of young men. As they turned 18, Private Ivor T. Burstwhistle, a junior reporter of the Melbourne Age, was one of these men and he fell into the habit of complaining as swiftly as the older men. Leaving Broadmeadows camp on 6th of May 1915, he began his diary. He says, extensive and chaotic preparations for our departure from Broadmeadows. Issue of equipment and general kit dis distinguished by lack of method and individual eccentricity. For instance, QM, 
store left the issue of boots to the last minute when boots handed out respective of size and I got 8.5, which I was told I could change on board. It was said of the men who rushed to join up when war was declared that they were dinkum Aussies, nationalism. The men who joined later after hearing of the fearful death toll were called fair dinkums, men who enlisted even though they knew the odds were against them. Leaving Mitcham Camp, South Australia, young Roy Bice, and in brackets AAMC, who later was awarded the Military Medal for Bravery under fire and died in the mud of Flanders, touches the heart of the matter. Writing in his beautiful hand in ink, an achievement few soldiers rose to in those pre biro days when they could not easily carry liquid and must mix water to their powdered ink. All is hustle and bustle this morning, preparing for our departure to a destination unknown. The wagons are going this morning, the men tomorrow. I be, I be, I'm being, I being a wagon orderly, go with the transports. Reached the outer harbour at 4.30 in the afternoon and found Mother Eva and the kiddies. They're waiting for me. Can tell you I was pleased to see them. Had tea in the station kiosk and I was wondering when we should meet again. But when their train left, leaving me alone on the platform, I confess tears would come to the surface. Made beds in the ambulance wagon and tried to sleep, but it was useless. Troops arrived at 11 a.m. The crowd, a couple of hours earlier, barricades were placed each end of the wharf, but when the men came along, there was a push and overwent the obstacles. Girls rushed in and picked out, out their particular friends. One girl clung around her boy's neck and wouldn't let go for quite a while. Gee, I'm glad nothing like that happened to me. That's the worst of being in love. At last, all the men were marched on board the old Geelong, which was our transport. Streamers of coloured paper were thrown up to the boys from friends on shore. It was a great sight. At last the third whistle blows and the cables are released. The vessel slowly moves away from the wharf. The paper streamers break, leaving a portion in the hands of the people on shore. The remainder with the lad who is going away to fight for them. Guess you would find those pieces of paper in many homes today as the boys carefully rolled theirs up and placed them in their pocketbooks. They would have touched them and smelt them. I feel some tears coming up myself for their leaving those that they love. The band is playing, everyone is cheering or singing. Someone tries to shout a message to the shore, but is useless. Everybody is happy. I kept my eyes on those heads and waved till I couldn't distinguish them from, from the others. Leaving Australia behind is the most trying circumstances of all, wrote Private John Millard of the 1st Battalion when he left in 1915. The scenes on the wharves were mothers, wives and sweethearts are weeping and not expecting to see many of their loved ones again are most trying. Once they were too far from the shore to distinguish the faces left behind, the men sought their quarters. Roy Bice found that the beds were hammocks, hung on hooks in the rafters ahead, overhead. When all the chaps were in the hammocks, they were touching. So you can imagine how closely we were packed in. <clears throat> Hadn't been in bed long before I felt the rolling of the boat. Here we go, thought I, and it was. Fortunately, our quarters were on the well deck, so it was not long reaching the side. One consolation, I was not the only one. That night was a nightmare. First time I had been seasick. 
June 3, about 1,600 on board, and I believe we are to pick up only a couple or 300 more at Fremantle, that's in Perth, Western Australia. Do not know where they are going to be packed, poor beggars. Cheer Up Society sent on a good many cases of apples for the troops, but have not seen any up to date. I noticed the officers have fruit every day. Something for Rupert to note. <laughs> they arrived at Fremantle on 5th of June to see a crowd on the, on the wharf. All disappointment as we are anchored in midstream. There is a great talk of a route march tomorrow. Men are very dissatisfied at not being allowed to go ashore. When darkness fell, many slid down ropes onto boats and reached the wharf that way. Hell of a row. <laughs> Good on them. <laughs> Took the officers all their time to quieten the mob. Some of the heads were absolutely bluffed. In the end, the men put their rifles away. Of course, they had no ammunition. But things were ugly for a time. 8pm, had our usual sing-song at the stern of the boat. About four piccolos to accompany us. Sing ourselves hoarse. <laughs> June 7th, drew into the wharf this morning. Took on the WA troops, Western Australia. And then pulled out in midstream again. Boats loaded with people came out to us all afternoon. After 10, the men applied for leave and were refused. So an attempt to lower the boats was made, but was not successful. <laughs> they were a rebellious lot, which is good. <laughs> they gave it a go and got caught. <laughs> a few of our own lads managed to get off. Some had their people there. Don't blame them. Root march is Hoff, H-O-F-F. -F. I don't know what that means. Going to bed early. 100 or so on shore got there by boat or swimming with their clothes on. June 8th, the food is very much inferior to what we got in camp. You should see some of the stews, great pieces of fat floating around in dirty water. Spuds boiled in jackets, which have not previously been washed. Oh, it's a great life. Yeah, they suffered, mate. We, we don't realise how they were treated. Bread is scarce, not enough by a long way. Orderly officer, officer comes around at each mealtime for complaints, if any. He never leaves without a dozen complaints. It's the soldier's privilege to grumble. Left Fremantle without warning at 11am. Though we were to stay there for a few days longer, expect the heads took a jerry and sailed to stop further trouble. <laughs> That's the lingo of the time. The heads would be the, um, the officers. <laughs> they called them the heads. <laughs> That's hilarious. I never heard that. Took a jerry. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> have to look it up. And sailed to stop further trouble. Only a 100 or so left behind some of our lads among them. Behaviour on board much different to last night. Each state as though they were still separate colonies. So in Australia we've got a state system. So he's just making a comment. He says as though they were still separate colonies and had to ask separately, what price me now? That's an interesting statement. Kept recruits coming. The small states and those with great and let me see, it's got in brackets, to the people of the cities, mysterious hinterlands, proudly recruited and sent away men as though they had them to spare. News of the landing sent another wave of volunteers into camps from Hobart, across to Perth, Cairns, down to Port Lincoln, that's South Australia. Embarked from Brisbane, 2pm, 28th of the 6th, 2015, oh, 2015 1915. Wow, it's 19 years ago, oh, 119 years ago, <laughs> what am I saying, that's funny. No, it's actually um, 104 years ago, 
So it was 1915, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, yeah, 104 years ago. This is really looking back in the past. So embarked from Brisbane at 2pm, wrote Private W.E.K. Grubb, a Tasmanian from the fishing village of Stanley. He had enlisted in 1915 only six weeks earlier on 11th of May. It was obvious that the enthusiasm of civilians had in no way cooled. All around the entrance to the camp, a crowd of Queenslanders had assembled to bid farewell to the disorderly Tasmanians and to wish them Godspeed. That's nice. We moved off at 2.20 p.m. to the tune of It's a Long Way, etc. <laughs> and the thermometer standing at about 103 degrees. Whoa, that's hot. There are about 2,000 of us on board, packed like sardines. By 1st of September, he was riding from Egypt while awaiting transport to the Dardanelles. Now the time is drawing close, I feel calm and fit and just a little bit eager to get out into the line of fire and avenge some of those wrongs committed on defenceless women. Interesting statement, isn't it? So there'd been some sort of propaganda about them having to protect or that they'd committed atrocities against women, which happens in every war by every side, I might add. Just sort of adding in that there was some resistance against the women who were protesting against rape in war. They saw that as irrelevant and it wasn't. They were also victims of war. But nonetheless, here we go. Um, they're using this statement of committed against defenseless women. I found that interesting. I shall hate to take life, but I, ju I feel justified in wrecking vengeance, wreaking vengeance on these allies of an unspeakable, though cultured, Hun. It's really interesting to describe it that way. One always says allies. Oh, so he's wreaking ven vengeance on the allies of them. That's the Turks, this is Gallipoli. Not the actual Huns themselves. It's funny how he said unspeakable, though cultured, Hun. I see thousands of wounded in the hospitals here and, a hun and hundreds coming in daily as well as disfigured and broken down heroes. When he entered 13th of October 1915 in his diary, he was himself a part of the broken down army of, on Gallipoli. Fever and dysentery. I've seen men here big and strong and healthy one day and in a week's time walking skeletons. This is no exaggeration. Today I've been ill working all the same. In military circles, it is a crime to be sick and not report, but today I care nothing for pain or anything bodily, for I have received two letters from my darling. 10th of November. Of all the ragtime, ragtime armies in the world, ours is in the front rank. Many men have undoubtedly lost their lives through inefficiency of officers and the jumbling of orders. Later in the day, he adds, pack up and prepare to go on tromp. Packs weighing something over 100 pounds. Head for Happy Gully. Bullets flying round and dirt coming over us. The closest call I've had yet. I went down fully expecting to be hit though the, uh, through the head. And the next I felt dirt flying and kicking up around me and a feeling of relief. We got quickly to our feet and heard another shell coming and ran for shelter to, the, to a water tank behind which a crowd of men were sheltering. We reached this in time to escape being run down by the mule teams and Indians who were clearing out in all directions. From the firing line I can see Turkish trenches 30 yards away and between their lines and ours the bodies of our chaps can be seen Lying in the positions as they fell. These poor chaps have been reported missing and will have to remain until the end as it is impossible to get them. And in the heat of the day, the Turks stir up the bodies, stir the bodies up with bullets 
to try to create disease from the stench. The flies are something fearful out here. No doubt this will someday be a fashionable watering place for tourists who will come to see the place on which their dead heroic friends and relations fought. They shall know them by their bones along the way. And of course, we have many ceremonies now at Gallipoli. And here he is imagining those ceremonies in the future. And it's like a fashionable place and what he's really saying, it's a friggin' hellhole. Horrendous. He says, I will try to sleep and dream. I'm back in Tasmania on the banks of the South Esk, eating bananas. Neath the shade of its glorious willows as I did one summer not long ago. Two days later, on the 12th of November, he collapsed with enteric fever and was carried to the 13th Casualty Clearing Station, where he wrote that bullets are flying and shrapnel is screaming among the wounded and ill. He was carried to hospital in Cairo and then sent back to Tasmania in 1916. The doctors, who had earlier turned away men with dental cavities, were by now far less selective and many men who had been invalidated home re-enlisted and were past medically fit. Here he joined a militia group, was commissioned lieutenant later in the year and by 10th of February 1917 was on the way to France with the 7th reinforcements of the 40th Battalion. Sapper Harry Dadswell enlisted in September 1915, a small but wiry lad. A boy from the bush, eh? The army doctor said. Did the Ararat country doctor sound your chest? Good. Go and put your clothes on and you'll do. <laughs> you'll do. Later, like many of the men who returned, he liked to recall those early days of enlistment as though they were their boyhood or perhaps because it was the end of it. I never forget our first instruction on bayonet fighting. It brought home to us we weren't playing. After showing us how to hold and handle a rifle with a bayonet on the, on the, on the, instructor, on the instructor said, go in with the point and if that is turned aside, bring the butt down, butt to his face and kick hard to his middle. He looked at us and stopped. The bayonet is the knife at the end of the gun. That's what they, they jab into these other boys their age. Then he lowered his rifle and said, take that shocked look off your faces, men, and get, in, get this into your heads once and for all. This is war, and the only thing that counts is you win and live. There are no rules, no umpires, and if you die, think of what will happen to your folk at home. So don't die. <laughs> what will happen to your mothers and sisters if the enemy beats us? So they, he's using the emotional stuff to manipulate the guy that he mustn't die because it's a waste of money if he does. <laughs> they have to win, see? And there's no rules. Yet there was the Geneva Conventions, I'm assuming. I don't know. I'd have to look it up, actually. Maybe after the First World War. No rules. <laughs> Sounds like warfare today. These, these days there seems to be no uh, rules either. He, he then says, What will happen to your mothers and sisters if the enemy beats us? If you die, it doesn't matter how. There is no one to protest. No one to say it wasn't fair. So see the enemy dies, not you. And of course that enemy are boys just like them who are being told the exact same thing by their officers. Norman Young joined up the day he turned 18 in 1917. The Bendigo Advertiser reported, having attained his 18th birthday on Saturday, Mr N M Young, son of Mr J.N. Young, a member of the Advertiser, composing staff, enlisted for 
active service. And in the evening, a number of friends assembled at his place of residence in Honeysuckle Street to congratulate him upon the step he had taken and wish him many happy returns on the day, because his birthday. A very pleasant evening terminated with the singing of the national anthem, God bless our splendid men. God bless our splendid men, send them safe home again. God save our men, keep them victorious, patient and chivalrous. They are so dear to us, God save our men. The following week, the same newspaper reported the dismissal service at St. Paul's Church. This is in Adelaide. Oh, Bendigo, sorry. Several hundred members of St. Paul's Church and Sunday School gathered on the occasion of a dismissal service conducted by the Reverend J.H. Cranswick for Messrs. W. Birch, K. Birch, Norman Young, H.B. Field, and W. Buchanan members who have recently been accepted for active service and are leaving this week to enter camp. We want to say to you, said Mr. Cranswick, we like the idea of saying goodbye in this our dear old church. For we want you to remember that from this day on, God helping us, there will, there will never go by a day until God in his mercy brings you back but that you will not be prayed for in the church. Every night at 5.30 o'clock and every Sunday morning or evening, your names will be put up before Almighty God for his protecting arms to be around you. But Young and his friend H.B. Field were not quite 18 and a half years old and permission to embark with the 25th reinforcements was withheld. That they were not easily dissuaded is shown by the following letter to the Prime Minister, William Morris Hughes. I oh, don't know much about this Prime Minister, but I do know where I lived in Canberra. I lived in Garran. Hughes was the next suburb. So clearly Hughes was named after a former Prime Minister who I had never heard of. See, we just don't know. You know, we, we really don't know much. And I'll... This is a quote from the letter. Both of us are only two months short of the required age. We think it hard that we should be kept from sailing with our mates with whom we have trained since we entered camp. It has also come under our notice that a certain member of the reinforcements, also under the age of 18 and a half, has been allowed to embark through obtaining the influence of a military official. Our parents have given their consent. We cannot understand why one can go and another kept back. Both of us held commissions in the 17th Senior Cadets and have been in camp three months. Apart from this, we enlisted to do our bit along with the other lads. Also, we shall reach the age of 18 and a half by the time we arrive in England. In reply, they received a memo informing them that the Prime Minister is taking this matter up and will advise. They lobbied everyone they thought could help. Their persistence was unending. Permission to sail with their battalion was given, but in England permission for their transfer to the trenches in France was withheld. The correspondence started yet again and once more they won out. <laughs> they were persistent. <laughs> we're going. John King also joined in 1917 when he turned 18, speaking 60 years later, his, recoll his recollections were clear and honest. And so I, I'm just going to read that. By the time I joined the army, the war had been going for several years. It was well known it was no picnic. But still at the time, the propaganda that they used to put in the papers that was winning this and winning that also made us believe we was going to finish the, the war next year. Even when I went away from Australia, they told me I probably wouldn't get there before the war was finished, but that didn't come to pass. They made everybody believe that it was not exactly a holiday, but an experience that everyone ought to have. That's why they went. So these feared incomes went, 
believing it was going to finish and that they should go. They're encouraging that then the media. So this is for you, Rupert. The media was the ones that encouraged them to go to war and are still doing it today, still promoting war. What have we learned? So here we go. I'll keep going and listen to this man's voice who probably is no longer alive, I would say. He said, when I went there, there was people getting killed and we knew it wasn't any picnic. I think if I'd been working, I would have waited a bit longer. My school friends were there and I joined the 37th Battalion as I enlisted from Brunswick and I had to go in, in reinforcements for battalions of Brunswick men. Each munici municipality had a quota to try and fill and Brunswick Council, this is here in Melbourne, would be notified that I had enlisted. But you know, 18 is too young. The strain is too big, is a bit too great. Anyway, when you went into camp, you were told you'd be 7th reinforcements to the 37th Battalion. In units raised in this way, there was a fair chance you'd run into men you'd known in civilian life. So that's really interesting. So they they had them where they've come from, municipalities, he's saying. They recruited them and kept them together so they had mates. So they wouldn't abscond, that was why, to keep them there. And then if their good friends died, they would fight more aggressively because they were hurting. When did I enlist? Well, I was out of work. I was in the building industry. And as all building supplies were bought from overseas and the shipping during the war was all directed to military purposes and the industry came to a standstill. You know, you gotta eat. You had the choice of being out of work or you join the army. So I joined the army because you know, and it stops. They tr oh, he, he keeps going. They trained for three months at Seymour. Funny training. Left turn, right turn. How do we spend the money we earn? <laughs> sort of thing. Left turn, right turn. Where do we spend the money we earn? <laughs> so they got obviously paid to fight. <laughs> so poverty, unemployment. Speaking of those subjects which have been raised in the lectures, the, the Boyer lectures that I've been commenting on, was why they went to fight. These are your mainstream young boys who don't know any different, who are trusting what's being said, that they're fighting for a greater purpose. He sailed on the Ballarat, an extract from the famous diary on this ship reads for 26th of April. Torpedoed by Cripes, by Cripes. The ship was 60 miles from Southampton. I don't know what that means. Um, torpedoed by Cripes. Maybe if anybody sees this video, they can perhaps send me a message. Like a lot of other people, I was repacking my kit bag. I was marking with an indelible pencil my number and name on my underclothing, clothing, uniform, etc. And lots of us were at this. And we were supposed to be on deck at 2 p.m. for a memorial service for the Anzacs who lost their lives at the landing in 1915. And all of a sudden this whoom come and the boat shivered from end to end and not a soul spoke. And all of a sudden I heard someone say, the bastards have got us. <laughs> That's very Aussie. <laughs> the bastards. Fortunately for us, the torpedo had struck on the stern of the ship the submarine guard who were to watch out for torpedoes, you could see them travelling under the water. They had sighted the submarine earlier and saw the torpedo leave the sub. And they telephoned the bridge and the captain began to slew the ship around and it only hit the stern and knocked the propeller off. And we had a gun mounted on the stern and it was put that out of action. And it put that out of action. There was wheat in the stern and that swelled up when the water came in and they realised the boat wouldn't sink right away. 
I'll always give credit to the Royal Navy. They brought one of their destroyers right alongside and put planks over and there wasn't enough lifeboats to take all of us. So I was glad because I couldn't swim and, and you could imagine the number of men who got from one boat to another in a few minutes. But I got off in a lifeboat and it was like you, re you read about. Women and children first because there were two nurses in it and I was only a boy. All the lifeboats were hooked up one behind the other and before night fell, there was, the, there was the best sight I'd ever seen in my life as all the ships came to our rescue. <laughs> That's great. They sent out an SOS and all sorts of ships came from all directions and there were cruisers, destroyers, trawlers, passenger ships, everything. At this time we were in the shipping channel, nearly in the sight of the English coast. Within 15 minutes of abandoning ship, we saw them begin to come over the horizon from every direction, smoke belching as they put on speed. Isn't that great? And that's that feeling that people care about you. And that's a beautiful memory for this man. The first thought to come on the scene were the French aeroplanes who were over us in five minutes or so. And that saved us from being fired on again and the planes were dropping depth charges to the sub, which made it scare, itself scarce. <laughs> Whew, out of there. So it's a bit like bullying, isn't it? It's like, oh, we got them, you know, got the advantage, we're going we're gonna to sink that ship. And then others come along and they hightail it, get out of there real fast. And that's the game, isn't it? Kill or be killed. And that's been made pretty clear in this. No rules. The name of the game is to win. If you don't win, and that's why the military are always thinking like this. You can't, you can't lose, and yet they do. And they have to think about this. You know what? What is this game that's being played out here that so many people suffer from? Anyway, he says we have a reunion for the survivors of the Ballarat every Anzac Day. And years later, we received a letter from the German commander of the submarine that thanked the Ballarat. <laughs> How interesting! And he put in the letter that he was only doing his duty as we were and that he was already pleased that there was no loss of life. Now, isn't that beautiful? I really love that. That's peace gesture from a German sub commander. They were all just doing their duty. See, they're innocent. All the soldiers are innocent. It's the ones bloody the puppet masters that I'm interested in, pulling all the strings, who won't resolve conflict, who extend power. For their own interests. See? He said that he was now the only man alive that was on that sub when it sank the Ballarat. Oh, that all died of old age. Because after he completed the cruise, he was transferred to another command, leaving the crew on the submarine. The sub then went back to sea and was lost with all hands. Oh, that's sad. No, they didn't die of old age, they actually died in war. He just got, he was the lucky one. I was picked up by HMS Hardy, a destroyer, and put ashore at Southampton. And we were told that the Germans had sunk 110 ships that week. God, can you imagine that? For all that, they had hot food waiting for us and some straw to kick around on the floor to sleep on. So it would have been hard sleeping on the floor. When I arrived at Lark Hill, I found that the English army had decreed that no one was to go into the trenches until they were 19. So we were kept for guard duty. They called us the war babies. This caused me to be court-martialed. It wasn't for anything bad. I was on guard one day, our own men, and some of these fellows were particularly bad characters and this day one thought he'd put on a stunt. I was given a prisoner to take to the doctor's surgery. The corporal sent me off alone with him. I knew nothing about the man I had learnt later. He'd escaped four times before. He'd been up for court martials, but they didn't tell me. He nipped out of the surgery window, but I didn't know. 
Eventually I found out and reported it. I always believed it was the fault of the administration who should have told me he was a desperate character. And we should have had an officer in charge of us, war babies, guard. They put me in a detention camp for six weeks where I had to sit on my backside and read books. And when they marched me down to the court marshals, to the court marshaled, they had a guard on, of six men, a sergeant and a lieutenant in charge of me. And here I'd been sent off alone with that desperate bloke. It was all show. Now in the court martial, I'm not supposed to say a word. Supposed to leave it to the council allotted me. But he was on their side and made no point of my being sent off alone with the dangerous character when it should have been several men in charge of an officer. Well, the sergeant and the lieutenant had been out having a few beers, but now they said the lieutenant gave orders to the sergeant, the sergeant to the corporal, and the corporal ordered me, etc., etc. I could see how it was going, but there was nothing I could do. I waited another five weeks in the detention camp. They had to find me guilty. Otherwise, they would have had to go the higher-ups and that would never do. So they marched me out on, on the parade ground, still under this guard. The men are formed up in a square and they read your sentence out, what you're charged with. I was charged with not paying proper attention to what I was doing and letting a prisoner escape. The least they could sentence me was seven days. So all in all, I spent two or three months in the detention camp, but I got my payback, all except the seven days. So it was, it was all an experience. Anyway, it probably saved my life because by the time I got to France, the Battle of Messines was finished and lots of reinforcements were killed. Young Will Dodds set, set off on the 22nd of December 1916 with a parcel of cake from his granny. Willie, aged 18, had known, had known ever so slightly Glenny of the same age. He wrote to her in a tentative fashion at first and then became bolder and signed off as your own adoring will until 11th of July, 1917, as the Battle of Paschendal began. And this is how the letter goes. Just before I read the letter, this business of setting up these guys, not taking responsibility and protecting senior ranks, I reckon that's a real issue in the military. Being seen to be, him having to look after a guy who is known to escape and he's, he's clearly very young. So they should have taken responsibility and he noted that. So this is something people don't forget. They never forget when they've been betrayed and blamed and when they see that people don't take responsibility in the higher positions, they're covering their ass, is what we call it in Australia. It's not respected. And that's what happens, you know, when you've got so-called professional soldiers, you know, who are supposed to have a certain standard certainly not living up to it so this is the letter from young dodds to this this girl dear glenny you must excuse this photo but i hope you will hold it dear to you as it is the last photo before crossing into real action we fall in to go over at 1 15 a.m tomorrow morning accept my very best love and kisses once more today, as this is the second note. Au revoir, au revoir. Very best love from your own loving soldier, Will. He then drew a circle and placed a large X in it. Strictly private. I've kissed this spot, dear. Until this time, he had never called himself her soldier and had been bantering lighthearted. Stop worrying about my meeting girls. They are all far away from us here anyway. Twice Guy Martin, Marty, 
Barry had attempted to enlist but had been knocked back owing to, to a weakness left from typhoid fever contracted as a child. To avoid being handed a white feather in the street, he wore on his lapel the big shiny badge issued to the medically unfit. After the heavy casualties of 1916, he volunteered again, was accepted and sailed immediately. So I wonder why they give them a white feather. Maybe that was a, um, I don't know, you a dove or something. You know, maybe that was disapproval, which is why he had to wear this medically. You know, he was medically unfit. So, so it was a lot of pressure. What that tells me it was a lot of pressure for them to go to the war. This is not discussed on Anzac Day. They felt pressured to do it. If they didn't do it, it was like betraying your country. You're a traitor. You're a coward. These are the things that were far worse for the young fellas than being killed in, 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 and, and having that honour, that glory. Now, I played the video before about wild boys and the, the word glory was coming up. So it's better to die in glory, they think, whimpering on a bloody battlefield than being, you know, bullied and ostracised at home. That's something for people to think about. Is that better for them? Would they have been better off staying home? You know, given that a lot of the Australians were put in the front at Gallipoli, cannon fodder. We see this happening in wars where those they respect least or are valued least are the ones in the front. The dominant cultures are in the back, <laughs> protecting themselves. And the thing with Australians is that we're very innocent and we're very loyal. Certainly in those days, all soldiers, probably all around the world, I'd say would be the similar. You know, I can try and, you know, connect to nationalism here, but in truth, it's I can see it being the same everywhere. These young men marching off to try and protect their country and their families. That's what they were doing. And it's, I don't have a problem with honouring their memory myself, but I have real struggle with the ones who sent them off to war. So my, um, I don't resonate with the reasons they went to war because I'm into peace and I resolve conflict. And I just see over and over and over this projection of power in order to, you know, stay in pole position, to, to stay in a form of um, empire, to retain that empire status, which is about power, control, influence and resources. There's got to be other ways to share the bounty with everyone. So he says he had his hair cut short to the scalp, to his scalp, all except a little tuft or curl in front, <laughs> which the divisional signalers affect. Like most of the letter writers, he was anxious to cause his home folks as little heartache as possible. Yeah, he didn't want to do that. Yeah, they don't want to cause them pain when they write. I shall write regularly, but any number of unexpected things happen to prevent mail getting through. Should a man be wounded, notification would reach his people long before his letters stopped. Anyway, the diggy sigs seem to be a lucky crowd. <laughs> the passing of the old year and welcoming the new year was the last Marty would see, and he enjoyed it as if he knew it would be his last. New Year's Day 1917, given entirely to the sports. Nearly everyone has entered for something just for the fun of it. Have you ever seen cockfighting? Well, one chap is horse and the other rider. <laughs> oh, that's funny. The rider is carried about on the horse's back. He tries to drag the opposing rider from the steed. The first pair that fall are the losers. Sometimes with an evenly matched lot, the two riders take their arms from around the necks of their respective horses and fight with both hands. <laughs> the scrap 
then you, generally resolves itself into a tug of war with each rider hanging on to the other and each horse pulling at the ankles of his rider. <laughs> One of the riders must come off. <laughs> we have just been paid one pound and have some already started banker <laughs> and have some, and, and some, sorry, have already started banker. Some of them will have lost it all in a few minutes, so they were gambling on who was going to win, essentially. There was a poker school full swirl and the porthole was open and a whacking big wave came and swamped them. Now they're all clinging or changing their clothes. <laughs> These last few months were full of interest for him. Durban was a delight. The Durban Corporation allows soldiers and sailors to travel free on the electric trams which run through the town and suburbs so we fly about everywhere. Finishing up with a bath, a bathe in the surf, it was A1. Ever since leaving Melbourne, we had promised ourselves a good dinner when we shall land. So us four sappers walked around into a hotel and as though we were colonels and gourmandized to our heart's content. <laughs> All too soon, it seems, his hour came. He was killed at Paschendale, the third battle of Cy uh, Cyprus, I would say that is, on the 4th of October 1917. His brother Geoffrey was killed at Villers Bret Bretonneau. Bretonneau <laughs> is French. Looks like Bretonox if I'm to read it in the Australian vernacular, but it's not. It's Bretonneau, something like that. Forget, forgive me for I have said very, the French words very badly. Durban was one of the few stopovers for reinforcements en route for the front. Here they received a great welcome. The young driver, Cripps, who on 4th of August 1914 had volunteered to sail with the first Australian expeditionary force into the Pacific Ocean, is now Lieutenant B.A. Cripps of the 41st Battalion and leaving Brisbane. 16th of May 1916. Left Inogra station at 8am en route for Sydney. Inogra is in Brisbane. All along the line, the people gave us real good time. The men decorated and carriages with ferns and it looked real well. 31st of May at sea on submarine guard. All good shots. The guard is known as the tin openers. 18th of June, the yellow jack is flying on our our foremast in quarantine in Durban. Boer policemen and our guard preventing men from getting ashore. Another 100 men broke leave today and a couple received their first taste of the bayonet when they broke through the guard. We leave the docks and anchor in the bay. The people have been very good to us, gave us a lot of fruit and sweets. The ship stinks of sulphur from being fumigated. Just see how much further this goes. Oh, I'm nearly there. Another page. Stay with me because this is history that I'm reading and it's from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And that, for me, is the only history I'd be interested in reading in any case. I'm not interested in historians. I'm interested in the men that went there and what the experience was for them and what they thought after. So it goes on to say, ships were now shuttling back and forth across the world's oceans, taking fit men out and passing ships, returning to Australia with the wounded and sick. On the clan McGillivray, uh, McGillivray bound for the front in October 1916, the ship's news sheet, the McGillivray Magster, wrote after leaving Durban, Many thanks, Durban. Your doors were thrown open to us and we found a welcome in your homes. Your trams were ours to make use of. Portals of your zoo were open wide. You showered us with kindness in a hundred ways and for it all you have our grateful thanks. As the sentimental bloke says, I dips me lid. That's dipping your lid. <laughs> I dips me lid. And this is, of course, the positive part of war. 
is allies where they feel they're on the winning side, the right side, and people feel senses of solidarity with one another because they're all in it together. And that's what we're all seeking out is a sense of unity. But unfortunately, it seems to be in adversarial situations that people get this sense of, you know, feeling part of the group, feeling they belong, feeling bonded like a family. One fair income was in the unique position of being a woman <laughs> writing brave letters to her sweetheart. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> Who was safely at home. Matron Gertrude F. Moberly, later RRC, sent scores of very personal letters to her beloved Peter from some of the world's most outlandish hospitals. Maybe, she says on her first night away in July 1915, the little fishes will be my companions. I hope not. They are cold. I like warm companions. <laughs> here, here we are all on board the troop ship or Sova and thrilled to the marrow bone at the future all unknown. So excited. Determined in our fluttering hearts to make good. Poor old boy. Do not worry too much. It's no fault of yours that that appendix had to be removed just when typhoid fever was doing its darndest to make a certainty of your having your toes turning up to the daisies. <laughs> that means dead. <laughs> oh, Pete, I must confess to a prayer of thanksgiving to be to the bon Dieu for making the MO definitely decide that you are you were unfit for active service. Of course, had you been fit and not offered, then I should have been equally upset, for you would not have been the man I believed in and love. We left the wharf at 10.30 a.m. and I sadly missed your dear, darn, dear old face among the crowd seeing us off. Thank you for the lovely roses. I kissed them all for you and was aching to see you again. <laughs> Our parting was so short. I shall write often and you must do likewise. Gertrude was a Mossman woman. She's from Sydney, I think. They'd be saying that. And as time passed, an unspoken critic of the war. Mm. When I return, I'm going to go into politics. Oh, that's interesting. On whichever side favours anti-war. Interesting. Those are the men I will vote and canvass for. Another time she writes... What have we personally against the Germans? It is simply awful that millions have to suffer to satisfy the greed of a few in high positions. And that's why, lest we forget, that's for me is lest we forget. We're all suffering <laughs> for those in high places. That's what I see. Okay. But at the same time, we're on a journey too, and we're here to have an experience. We had awakened even back then. She says, but all this was later. Her first letters are a strange amalgam of many emotions. The Orsova arrived in Melbourne about noon. We have all been most excited watching troops being brought on board. Also sisters from Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania. And as we watched along came the HS Kyara, with all her poor wounded boys. Oh, what cheering they received. But Peter, I could not stop the tears falling. My own two darling brothers killed. And Will, the only brother left in camp at Inogra, Queensland. All these 1,400 boys too. How many of them would return? Or perhaps return in a 10 or 15 years be forgotten? All this hectic talk of our brave boys is sincerely said now, and every word meant, I grant, but I but a promise must now sorry, a, but a promise made now is not genuinely thought to be, and in brackets, and is, I feel sure, a bond. To be kept for all time. But Peter Darling why the Bible knows the unreliability of man, even princes. Mark my words, 
The day will come and a retribution when all this money so lavishly borrowed by those at the head of affairs all over the world will fall on the unborn men and women to come. A depression which will cause misery and starvation to many. For any thinking man and woman who studies the history of finance and economics knows the aftermath of war, heavy taxation, which, darling, you and I, as well as the millions, will have to bear. Well, how's that? I pulled that pretty much at random, that chapter, and I've obviously not read it before, so you're getting it firsthand. It finishes on a note that was totally unexpected, but I felt reinforced. So going back to Rupert Murdoch's statement about, you know, the the fact that we don't appreciate their sacrifice, I do now. I appreciate their sacrifice. And I would also state they didn't need to do it, that they were innocent people that went to war on behalf of those in high positions. And as she says, the taxation falls afterwards. Well, we're getting taxed big time in respect of the funds that taxpayers pay now into the military industrial complex because we've not learned any lessons from any of this. Still, soldiers are being sent off to war. I read, I had a look at, actually it was a News Corp um, book that was published at Christmas, this Christmas just passed. And I looked at the photos because I, I sort of, because I'm, into peace, obviously, I'm looking at the war situation. It had Afghanistan on the front of the cover. It was all photojournalism. I didn't realise it was News Corp until I looked closer. And I have to say, when I saw it was News Corp, I looked even closer. Now, this was about Australians going to war. I saw that as a form of propaganda because most of the photos were of US personnel who were soldiers. I don't think many of the Australians were actually in combat. I think they were sort of in support roles, engineering and things like that, I think. But there were a few shots of Australians, but not many. So the majority of that book was actually the American servicemen fighting in Afghanistan, but the heading was about Australians going to war. Now, journalism has to be honest and it does have to have integrity. And our... Our bond really has been broken with the media over a long period of time because we're not being told the truth. And I do think people think we are a lot, um, we're not very smart because we're not reacting and doing anything, but we are aware. And as I said in my previous video, people don't know what to do about all of this. They see the deception and the dishonesty. Those young men were sent off to war on the ba basis of propaganda. They were not even treated very well on the ships, as I've just read and found out firsthand from those who went. They were not fed properly. They were in hammocks. They didn't even have beds. You know, they were not allowed to have leave and when they went across to Perth. Because, you know, it's a long trip around Australia. Australia's a big country. And... Um, this sort of tension with the officers and they're the ones eating the fruit. You might remember what I said earlier. They were the ones eating the fruit. The fruit was given for the soldiers, not the officers. And then that, uh, that incident where the guy was um, court-martialed because a guy escaped when he'd taken him into a doctor and the guy had jumped out the window. He got blamed for that. He was a junior officer. He... Well, he wasn't even an officer, a corporal, not even that. But he was very inexperienced. And then they kept him in a, a, a camp, detention camp, for quite a long period of time. He goes into the court. He doesn't get proper representation. The council is on their side, not his. So it's a kangaroo court is what we call it here in Australia. This is the perversion of justice. This is why... Um, Military courts are of great concern because always they will be favouring the military. They're not necessarily seeking justice. So there we go. My account I've just read about the Anzacs. I don't celebrate Anzac Day every year, but I do feel a great love for my fellow Australians who went and I know they were innocent and they suffered terribly. 
and I can't celebrate their suffering. What I can celebrate is peace, is when we finally get our act together, we start to understand the futility of warfare. It's primitive. It's the middle class and lower class, if we're talking class system here, which I personally don't see, but others do. They are the ones who go off to war. The ones who get recruited are usually the uneducated ones. They're young. And then they're told to defend their country, fight for their country. Are they fighting for their country? I think many soldiers are getting disillusioned. I remember uh, interviewing Refuseniks, I think they were called. These were US uh, military personnel who came to Australia in actual fact. And this was about the war in Iraq and they came out um, against it. Certainly Scott Ritter, when he spoke in here in Melbourne, was very opposed to what was going on in Iraq. He said it was an illegal war of aggression. So what's starting to emerge, I feel these days, is that people are starting to recognise that the soldiers are being used and it's not to defend the people of which they honourably would do and they're prepared to die for their families because they love their families. Instead, there's all sorts of economic interests being served by the projection of power to maintain empires, to open up oil fields. This is not honourable. This is, this is industry having excessive influence in politics, which then enables, through their influence, soldiers to go to war on false premises, and that has not been dealt with. The allegation of an illegal war in Iraq and Afghanistan, Afghanistan was on the basis of the, Amer of the Soviet occupation, but then there was the issue of, you know, CIA bringing in, um, what, what they call, sometimes they call them freedom fighters, um, what did they call them? They were the Mujahideen type fighters who were brought, they were Islamic fighters that were brought into Afghanistan to fight the Russians. The Americans brought them in. So there's your, you know, implication there. You know what I mean? It's like we're not being honest about these wars and why they're being fought. And I look, I feel for the soldiers and I can see how it's very important to them not to be criticised because it's really hard for them to accept. It, it, a whole heap of stuff happens to the poor things, you know, and they've already gone through trauma, you know, and I, I think some of them end up in drugs. And I certainly know from the homelessness perspective of which I'm living, there's a lot of veterans that are on the street who are not getting the care that they need. And I've even read rhetoric around valuing them over other homeless, which is just a joke. You can't do that. Anyone that's homeless should be helped. Everybody's valuable when you start to learn of their story. So I felt to share that um, and I was definitely guided to it. So this was meant to happen, this video. And I read it out as I first read it as a first reading. I had no idea what was actually in the content of that chapter. So I'm asking Rupert Murdoch to take that one on board, lest we forget how the middle class and the lower class are used in war, is the message of this video. And let's find more appropriate and positive ways to resolve conflict globally so it's not costing the world $1 trillion. Now, the irony here before I finish is 10% of that, if that was redirected into humanitarian issues, such as sanitation, such as poverty, you know, healthcare. We're seeing our public sector declining because the money's getting shunted off into what I would call non-productive areas. 10% of global spending, if it's put into the population, the public, will probably end all war. And in fact, one thing I, I must end on is for sure, inner peace most definitely will change everything. You will not recognise the world. When we start teaching real peace, real inner peace, real responsibility and accountability, war is gone. And those who are in the industry will go, oh, no, we don't want it gone. Yes, you do, because it's your children and your grandchildren and the fact that our planet may not survive you. You do want it to end. What you really want is security. We need to work on that. Inner peace will bring you security. You won't need to fight and you won't be afraid of 
not having economic um, security. That's why I'm living in a homeless capacity. I'm exploring inner security, inner peace without the surety of income. And I can say to you very genuinely, I do feel peace and I'm not in fear. It means the, the world that we live in, the life that we live in, is a lot more than what you think. It was no mistake I was guided to that book today. I've never, ever seen an Anzac book in one of those little library <laughs> boxes ever. I've never looked for it. So there you go. I'll leave that with you in peace and with great love. And I want to send a deep feeling of peace to all the soldiers whom I love and treasure dearly and equally to all Australians and I would extend that around the world because everyone is my brother and sister. Take care. Bye.